tribe, welcome to HDDC, HD Designs Crochet. I'm Heather and this is my channel, all about the granny square and that good stuff. Right now, we are about to jump into another boss talk that I have got lined up for you and I'm buzzing for this, I'm buzzing for the entire series. So, if you're brand new, hi, hello and welcome, and if you're returning, hey tribe, what's good, what's happening? You will know if you're returning that I am doing a series on my channel, just admiring my granny's girls. <laughs> I'm doing a series on my channel called C2C, C2C, which is the crochet to cash series. And I'm putting a spotlight on different people that are, that's more spotlight ever, spotlight on this. I'm putting the spotlight on people that are using their crochet to um, make a living, whether that's a side hustle, part-time income, full-time income. Um, and we have had a lineup so far that has been great. So we have spoken to Rosina of Zines and Rogers about how to have your designs submitted to a magazine. We have spoken to Nicola of The Secret Crocheter about running crochet classes and creating your own kits and subscriptions, which was really, really good to speak to. Everybody so far has been so informative and helpful. Um, and then we also spoke to Kalisha of Quirky Monday about setting up her YouTube channel. And we spoke a bit about our differences in um, opinions on ad revenue. And I've got more coming on all of those um, topics, so different revenue streams, different ways I make my income, um, pattern sales, i got so much lined up for you. But today we've got another boss talk. Um, we are speaking to my tech editor, who is Linda Brown of Tabitha Thomas Studios. Um, and I've got a really good one for you today, all about what is tech editing, why it's so important, and um, yeah, let's just go into it because it's a good one. So get your crochet ready, get your cup of whatever, cup of tea, warm juice, and settle in and enjoy learning all of this good stuff because there's a whole world out there, a whole world that you can make an income from your crochet. AK Tribe, enjoy. Hi, thank you so much for coming on to HGDC today. Really glad to have you here. Do you want to introduce yourself to all of the viewers? Okay, yeah, it's really great to be here. I'm Linda Brown, I'm a tech editor um, and um, an aspiring designer. Um, I'm, my company name is Tabitha Thomas Studio um, and I've been tech editing now for about, oh gosh, about four or five years, I suppose, but two years full time. Um, and I absolutely love it. It was the best thing I've ever done, without a doubt. I've already got a hundred questions just for <laughs> that. <laughs> um, so just for all the viewers that are watching, they know that this is the boss talk. Um, I'm talking to all different bosses that use crochet or yarn um, as an income. So it's really, really great to be able to ask you. I've got so many questions. Um, I think the most logical place to start would be what is tech editing? Because there's going to be so many people that are just like, hmm? Yeah. Okay, well, um, tech editing is a form of proofreading, but finishing patterns or crochet patterns. And it's just to make sure that the pattern makes sense, um, that it flows in a logical order, that everything should be on it, is on it. Uh, the photos tally with whatever the design is. And most importantly, that the stitch counts work. Um, there's nothing worse than you're, you're knitting or crocheting away and you get to the end of the row and you, it's wrong, you know, and you think, oh, what have I done wrong? So you unpick it, you do it again, and it's still wrong, and it's actually the pattern that's wrong. So my job is to make sure that pattern, you pick it up and you can just work it and you know that it works. Um, I mean, people use test knitters or test crocheters, which is brilliant, and they can pick up, it's, it's really weird because Tech editors pick up things that test knitters might not pick up and test knitters pick up things that tech editors might not pick up because I'm just, when I look at a pattern, I just work it in my head. I don't actually sit and knit or crochet it. 
Um, so it's not until someone actually comes to knit or crochet that pattern that they might find something that the tech editors have missed, or this is something that not until you start working it, you sort of think, well, actually, you can't do it like that. You've got to do it this way. Yeah. So, um, but I can iron out all the, the major creases before it gets to that stage. Definitely. I 100% agree. You have to have a pattern tech edited. There's nothing worse than getting a pattern and it doesn't work. Mm. Um, and like you said, because I've been through this process a few times now, the tech editor, as a tech editor, you will pick out so many things and then I'll send it to testers and then they'll point out something that as you make it logically, it doesn't work, but because they're making it, they can point it out. So it's good mm. to cover both bases. Um, Absolutely. I think the, for most people, they think, well, why do I need a tech editor? And as you said, it's really important to make sure that the pattern's right, that the proofreading's there. Um, so will you talk about how you got into tech editing? Um, yeah. Um, well, I spent the majority of my working, well, I'd say the whole of my working life um, as a bookkeeper, and I just drifted from job to job, and it was not for me. I hated working for somebody else, and I always wanted to work for myself. And uh, one day I was looking around on the internet. I, to be honest, I can't even remember what I was looking for now. Uh, but I came across this um, thing about tech editing. And I thought, oh, what on earth is that? So I did some research. I looked at this, this website and it was all about editing patterns. And I thought, wow, that sounds like me. That's got me written all over it. And um, so I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to do the course. It was Jolie Kelly. Um, it was her Learn to Tech Edit course. And... Um, I thought, well, I'm going to do the course. It, it'll just be for fun, just to sort of, you know, it's something to do. It just sort of takes my knitting and crocheting to another level. And I did the course and I thoroughly enjoyed it and I just knew it was for me. So I put the word out that I could do it and I started getting a few clients here and there. And I was still doing my, my day job. And um, I started getting a few more clients and a few more clients. And I thought, hang on a minute, there's something in this. So then I took the big leap of going part time. And then I got a couple of really good gigs and I thought, you know what, I can actually do this full time. So, because I was so fed up in my day job, I can't tell you. I just thought, right, that's it. I'm off. So I, I handed in my notice. I left. And I thought, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> but I haven't looked back. I mean, it, it was scary to start with. But then, you know, once it's full time, once it is your job, you just go for it and you just get as many clients as you possibly can. Um, and as I say, I have not looked back. It really was the best thing I, I ever did. And I, I went full time two years ago, and I've loved every second of it. I haven't regretted it one bit. And that's the best thing to get up and be excited and happy about your day, to have no yeah. regrets, to pick your own working hours. Um, you're in control of the income you come in. If you want a, a bit more, you take some extra. If you want to take time off, you can. So that you haven't got to answer to anybody. You know, I've worked in jobs where they've been so petty that if you're just five minutes late because the bus is late, you know, oh, where have you been? You know, rah, 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 and you've got to make your time up. And I just, that's not me. That is so not me. I just like to come and go as I please. And if the work's there, I'll do it. You know, if I want to take some time, as you say, you're so totally flexible. You can do what you want when you want to. And that is just me to a T. And that's perfect. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of people watching will be like, I want some of that from you. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people can relate to that. I think virtually everybody can relate to that. And um, just going to go into, you went from part-time to full-time and like mm. you, said, you felt a bit, for a moment you were like, what have I done? Yeah. But then you've got all of your time to focus in on the thing that you really enjoy doing anyway. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, you don't have to split your time between going to work and, you know, coming back and sort of, Having just only having a couple of hours to do your editing, you've got all day, every day, you can plan what you're going to do, when you're going to do it. It's marvellous. It's brilliant. And to be honest, I, if I could have done this years ago, I would have done, but it, it just wasn't there because the internet wasn't there. Yeah. You know, it, it's all, we are all so lucky now that we can do internet based jobs. Yes. Um, you know, it's just changed everything for the better. You are living yeah. the dream now, living yeah. the dream. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So although it's not fully on the tech editing, I'm intrigued on the being full-time, so I'm going to ask some of my own questions. <laughs> um, 
do you have like regular um, clients or are you constantly looking for work? How do you manage that? Um, I have got a fairly good regular client database of, of clients, of, well, not really database, but a sort of client base of, of regular clients that do come along all the time with work. Um, I work for a, one of the um, internet rule companies, um, so they keep me nice and busy as well. Uh, but I'm always on the lookout for new clients because you do get lulls. I mean, it's, it's only natural. Um, so, yeah, I'm still on the lookout for, for new clients to increase my uh, client base a bit more. Um, so, yeah, you never stop looking. You never stop because you don't know you don't know what's going to happen to individual people. Circumstances change. People might be designing like crazy, and then suddenly for whatever reason they stop. Um, so it's not um, nothing's permanent, you know. So you've always got to keep looking around, and, you, and also it keeps you fresh. It keeps everything fresh because new designers come along with new ideas and new ways of doing things. Um, so it keeps your keeps you fresh, it keeps the ideas coming in, it keeps your mind ticking over. So it's, it's all good, you know, to keep looking for new clients and if new clients come along, to, to take them on, definitely. I, I, you know, I haven't got to that stage yet where I'm so busy I can't take anybody else on. <laughs> so I'm always looking for new clients, definitely. Knitting and crochet. Yes, that's a good point, knitting and crochet. Mm. Um, I have a hybrid pattern coming, knitting and crochet, so that'll oh. be fun for you. It's going to be oh, that'll be excellent. Granny square body, but then the rest is knitted, uh, like oh. body panels. I've started the granny squares. They're very similar to these. But anyway, um, so I've got a couple more questions now. So many questions. Still on the going from part-time to full-time, did you decide to put, like, um, emergency savings by as a as like a buffer did you have like a some people I've spoken to said oh, I've had a backup option in my mind that I could work part-time somewhere else if need be did you have any of that or did you just go nope I'm going for it and jump in um, I did have and still got a backup savings uh, pot yeah. for, for you know for, for, the, for the quiet times um, but no it's just a case of well I knew how much money I had, I knew how much money I needed to live on, I knew how much money I needed for my household expenses. And I thought, well, I can do it. You know, I mean, I, I don't live on my own, I've got my partner, so we sort of share the yeah. um, household expenses between us. So um, I knew that financially I could do it. And if, I, if there were quiet times, I had a pot, an emergency pot I could dip into. Um, I don't want to go out and get a part time job, do anything. <laughs> Now that I've I've got this life, I don't want to even for you know a couple of days a week or something. I don't want to um, go out there and work if I can't. You know, if I really don't have to, then I won't. How amazing is that though? That like I can just see how happy you are and contented with your job, and I want that for so many more people because mm -hmm. there's so many people like you were in their nine to five or whatever, and I just hate the very existence of it. But you're there all day. Yeah. That's right, you're there all day, and then by the time you come home in the evening, you're really tired, you have something to eat, and then it's time to go to bed, and then you get up and you do it all again, five days a week, with four weeks of a day a year. Horrible. <laughs> 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 now you are free. So I've gone, I've jumped straight into you going full time, but I, I would, I should start at the beginning and say, how did you come up with the name Tabitha Thomas Studios? Well. <laughs> Tabitha and Thomas were my two cats, oh. and they were, I, oh, they were gorgeous, I mean, if, you know, if you're into cats, I mean, they were just the best cats in the world, and they were Tabitha and Thomas, and um, I was sitting with a friend one day, and we were just chatting, and I was trying to think what to call my website, and I've had to, you know, I did one of those, um, uh, you know, sort of like writing down different ideas and what have you, and she looked at all the ideas I'd come up with, and they were all the usual sort of predictable ones and, and Thomas and Tabitha, actually no, Tom, Thomas had already passed away by then but Tabitha was still there and she pointed to Tabitha and she said, you know, you've got the perfect name right here. Uh, it didn't twig for a minute and then I twigged and I thought, oh my God, of course, Tabitha Thomas because then that way it's such, you know, I'm not saying, oh, it's Linda knitting or Linda yeah. Tech, yeah. tech editing or whatever. It's just a title and I, with, under that title, under that heading, I can do whatever I want. 
So I thought that was the perfect name. Now, of course, they've both gone to the great cat litter in the sky, but their name is on. So that, that's how Tabitha Thomas Studio came about. And it's amazing how many people, I write, you know, I'll, I'll send an email, somebody will send me an email, and I'll write back, best wishes, Linda, blah, 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 blah. And they'll write back, hello, Tabitha, this is Izzy. You <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> haven't actually noticed that my name's Linda. I don't mind, I quite like it, actually. But um, it's quite funny, I get so many emails like that. And lots of people do actually ask me, well, where did Tabitha Thomas come from? So I'm quite used to answering that question. I think um, Lottie and Albert, that's Lindsay of Lottie and Albert. She put something similar on her story as people say, hi, Lottie. And that's not her name. That was a name that she picked similar to you. I think yeah. based off names she wanted for her children but couldn't use. And people would be like, hi, Lottie. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's, it's bizarre. <laughs> aren't quite reading or maybe they just assume you've named it after yourself so maybe yeah and also I suppose it's confusing because my email is Tabitha Thomas I haven't got Linda at Tabitha Thomas or anything like that so people look at the email and think that is my name but I don't mind I think it's quite, <laughs> quite, quite cute <laughs> quite sweet yeah I think that's really cute because your your pets live on in that name yeah, yeah. Really nice and also if I was to go back to the beginning, I wouldn't have called mine HD Designs just because in the future, if I ever want to sell this on, I'm basically selling my entire name. And because it's got designs in there, like you said, it sometimes feels like it can really pigeonhole what it is I should mm. be doing. Whereas mm. if I'd have gone with Studio or just something else, it would have been a title. So anyone starting out in any venture, your name's so important. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and you've got to keep it um yeah neutral keep it as neutral as you can yeah definitely. Mm. some people do rebrand but i'm just going to keep mine but if i have my time over my name would be maybe why I'll don't you want to rebrand just because that's more work to do <laughs> <laughs> maybe i'll think about it another day but um i short it now as a hgdc so um yeah, and I just feel like it... That's a good idea. Cause actually, yeah, because Kate Davis, the Scottish knitwear designer, she used to be Kate Davis designer, but she now calls herself KDD. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that is a good idea. Yeah, so I've just been doing that. And all my old hashtags and just... I think it. I could do it, but it's a big commitment and um, a minimal effort where I can be, so nah. <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> I'd have to, I think it'd be really weird to all of a sudden go from welcome to HDDC to welcome to Blip. So, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe in the future, but not right now. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not effort because of the effort. Um, then my other question, because I got so many and I've done them all out of order, but hey, I'm having so much fun already. Um, so before you became a tech editor, you crocheted and knitted or knitted beforehand? Oh yes, I've been I've been knitting and crocheting since I was about four, well, about five or six. My mum showed me how to knit when I was tiny, tiny, because uh, she was an avid knitter. And then her friend showed me how to crochet. So I've been crocheting and knitting all my life. Oh. Um, when I was a teenager, I thought it was not cool to do this, so I didn't I didn't do it either for, for quite a few years. Yeah. And then when I left home and I, you know, I started doing it because back then. You didn't have all this gorgeous yarn that you have now. Yarn was pretty cheap, it was just acrylic or wool, and that was it. Yeah. So, um, because I've got quite a sensitive skin, I always bought acrylic yarn. Horror of horrors. <laughs> um, but it was cheap. So, um, so, when I first left town, I didn't have much money. I, that's when I started knitting again. And I really have to stop. I love it. And, I mean, I, I do both. I knit and I crochet, but knitting is my first love. Yeah. I would always opt for knitting more than crocheting, but I do do both. I think you, some, I think anyone that starts usually has a love. Like my love is crochet. I love to knit, but crochet is my first love. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, I think a lot of viewers will probably be thinking um about the course that you did. So you stumbled across it. Did you have a look for other courses, or did you just jump in for that one? Um. And I'm guessing you found it invaluable from. I did find it invaluable. Um, I did have a look, and at the time, I couldn't find anything else. It just seemed to be the only course out there. Um, I don't know if through the Knitting Guild or the crochet, you know, crochet Guild or any of those sort of guilds, whether they would have been one, but 
you know, our sort of Google mission tech editor and Joe Lee's course just kept coming up all the time. And I thought, well, it looks like that's the only one out there. I had a rummage around in Ravelry. I couldn't see anything else on there. So I thought, I'm just going to go for it. Had good reviews. Um, and yeah, it was definitely the best thing I ever did. It was a brilliant course. I and mean, it's changed a lot since I did it. Uh, she, she's uh, combined a lot of things and just made it into this one big course, whereas before it was a split into different, uh, different parts. I did do all of the parts. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was a brilliant course and it, it, it just led to so many openings and so many different things. So as an investment, it's definitely worthwhile. You're... You don't have to go to uni, you don't have to spend lots and lots of money, but it's definitely worthwhile putting an investment into a course so that you can then go on and do more and you've reaped the benefits from it, obviously. Oh, definitely, without a doubt. I mean, it's paid for itself over and over and over and over the years, definitely. Yeah. I mean, you can, you can probably work it out for yourself. Yeah. But it's always nice to have that backup of somebody to say, well, actually, no, that isn't quite right. You know, really, you should be doing it this way. Or, you know, just going through her course material, which I still got, which I still refer to from time to time. Yeah. Um, all of that is just invaluable. Yeah, definitely. I think you can self-teach, but there's always a comfort in having someone say, this is the way that I do it because of X, Y, and Z. And you can mm. learn from that. Um, and it steers you in the right direction. Absolutely. I mean, earlier this year, I did a sweater design course. Um, I wanted to, I mean, I'd, I'd already done a grading course, which was good, but it left more unanswered questions than questions yeah. answered. Yeah. Um, and then I saw the sweater design course, and I wanted to get into sweater design anyway, and it had a whole section on grading, so I thought, well, this could be really useful. So I took that course. It was um, Sister Mountain's course. Um, I, you've heard of it. I think you've mentioned it in the past, haven't you? Um, yeah, it was her special course, and that is a brilliant course. I thoroughly recommend that one as well. And her grading section in her course is phenomenal. I learned more from doing her grade, doing that, doing the grading in her course, than I did from doing the other grading course, which is a Joe Lee Kelly course, which is good, but I found the Sister Mountain one better. Yeah. Um, so that helped to consolidate my, my grading expertise while at the same time learning how to design a sweater. So that was invaluable, that course, that really was. Yeah, so you, you must always keep on learning. Yes. Always, always. Never, never, never think. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been around the block quite a few times, but you, you, get to the, you should never get to the point where you sort of think, I know it all, I know everything, because there's always something else to learn or a, a different take on things as well you know you might have been going on for years doing something this way and then someone says well you could actually do it this way and you sort of think oh my god that is such a better easier way of doing it or you know whatever it could be um so it's always it's great to just keep learning and keep trying new things which is what i've been doing and it's definitely mm. i have i'm on the waiting list for the sister mounting course um because I'm putting together my own grading course, but like you said, I always want to keep learning. So um, I've got loads of different books, so they're more knitting than they are crochet. Um, and my course I'm putting together is more for crochet, well, it is mm -hmm. crochet. You could learn as a knitter, but I refer to the more the crochet terms, which yeah. I've not found that anywhere else. Um, but yeah, I'm on the waiting list for the Sister Man one because I've had some really, really good stuff. So what, the design course? Yeah, yeah, she's got like, um, it was for the grading element that I wanted because like you said, you can always keep learning and yeah. I like to see the way other people do things because I have my way of grading, um, but I'm sure everybody out there has their own slight mm -hmm. way of doing it um, because you've got sort of a parameter of rules, but you can apply that differently just based on the different garment style. There's so many different ways that, that a design can differ. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. No, no two designs would be the same. So did you um, teach yourself to grade or did you do a course? I taught myself, I've never oh, done wow. a course. Um, I wanted to learn. I did um, sign up for something that was about $40 and it left me more confused than before. So I taught myself and I used an accumulation of free materials, books that I got. Um, Sari Knits, she um, has a channel and she did a little bit on 
how she uses spreadsheets. Sister Mountain's got a little bit about how she does hers um, and measurements. And then I got a couple of books and I just taught myself. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend anyone does it like that just because it was time intensive and frustrating. Um, because you, there's so much to learn all in one go. Um, but I was like, I've done a law degree. I'm going to be able to conquer this. So I just kept persevering, um, which is why I'm putting my course together so people have got a starting point. Mm -hmm. I said in any way that I'm an expert because I'm not, but I've definitely got more than enough there for the beginner to start. Um, and I've already put in there that I encourage you, there's like a list of texts that I've read before. I've got a new stack that I'm about to dive into. <laughs> um, <laughs> and different resources to go and check out and to try, like you said, you do my course, but maybe in a year's time you want to go and do another course mm -hmm. and just continue topping up your skills because there's Absolutely. so much to learn out there just in terms of like for knitting, especially cast on, different ways to cast on, different ways to cast off, different mm -hmm. ways people like to, like they start on the sleeve and they do the body and they go back. So there's, there's so many different things that you can learn. Absolutely. And it's yeah. fun. lots and lots of fun. I was just going to say that. It is brilliant fun. I love it. <laughs> yes, definitely. Mm. Um, my other question was, and my mind's just gone blank. Why does it do that? My other question was, um, your favourite designs you've worked on? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Where do I begin? Give us a minute. I mean, I could be really corny and say, well, this is the one I'm currently working on. <laughs> Oh gosh, now that is a question. Off the top of my head, I can't really think. I mean, I've got my favourite designers. Do you um, do with yeah, that? I mean, no, no, Miss Sabanda, bigger than life knits. Her, her patterns, her designs are just gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Um, she does all sorts of things. She does uh, sweaters and she does uh, socks and blankets and um, scarves and you name it, she does it. Shawls and whatnot. Um, I really love doing her her um, patterns. They're always something a bit different. They're always they're always just exciting to do. Um, I've just recently done a sweater for her that hasn't been released yet. She keeps the continues on her Instagram um, grid, um, and it's gorgeous. I, I I seriously think it's one of the best designs she's ever come up with, and I just can't wait. Um, I've got to knit it. I've got to knit it because it is just I love it. Um, another one of my favourite designers is, um, she hasn't done much recently, but um, an Estonian girl called uh, Raina Cruz, and she is seriously into um, brioche. Ooh. And she, Nancy, Nancy Marchant is the, is the queen of brioche, and I think that Raina is the queen in waiting, because her, her work is just unbelievable. And it's all self-taught, because being in Estonia, she hasn't got access to kind of books. You know, she can't get hold of books like we can so easily. So she's learned it all from YouTube, literally from YouTube. And her work, you check, her, check her out on um, Instagram. Her work is beautiful. It really is. She's got such an eye for detail, for colours, for everything. It's gorgeous. And that is mainly um, shawls and hats. Uh, she's also done, um, she's in the process of doing um, a, a load of, sweaters and whatnot for using the Estonian uh, traditional um, knitting stitch patterns. My, my, my mind's gone blank now. Because <laughs> um, they've got a lot of very traditional knitting styles and knitting motifs, that's the word I've been for, motifs in Estonia. So she's, she's using them to make her, uh, she's bringing them up to date in her own designs. And they are gorgeous. And the, the stories behind them are just beautiful. Um, yeah, it's really hard to pinpoint one particular <laughs> <laughs> design, but I think it's easier to pinpoint designers, definitely. Yeah, no, I, I'm going to check them out. I always like to find new designers, see what they're making. Um, I follow Skin Deer Knits because she uses a lot of her traditional motifs from the area she was brought up in. I've forgotten where it is now. I want to say Norway. Um, yeah, I like seeing all these different elements come in because it's different through each culture what, what is a standard design. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And there is there is such a rich um, each culture has its own really rich source of motifs and different designs and different way of doing things. That is is fascinating. It really is fascinating. Yeah, I'd like to do more on the history of knitting and crochet. Um, mm. I've got quite a few books on Aran knitting and all, all the different motifs, like all the charts and what all the different symbols mean. Different because motifs. they've all got story attached to yeah. them as well. Each one of the story. Yeah. I think with the Shetland knits as well. Yeah. A lot of those um, have got stories behind yeah. them. And the um, is it the Gern? Is it Guernsey from? Um, I've forgotten where now. They've got stories as well for the fishermen. Oh, Gansies. Gansies, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear. Um, it's because I only read these words, I don't hear them. So, yeah. I what I think they should be. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then my other question, it's come back to me, was you mentioned you work for a, did you say a wool company? You do. Yeah. How did that come about and what do you do? Um, well, actually, I got headhunted for that, which was absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Um, there's. Um, I've done a lot of work for uh, Lynn Rowe of the Wool Nest. She does a lot of crocheting. Um, and she was working for this company, um, but she decided for whatever reason she could no longer work for them. She had such a big workload of other stuff. Um, and she recommended me to them. And I was just so chuffed. I was over the moon. She, and I was out of the blue, because um, she was about to email me to warn me that they were going to email me. Um, but they just straight away, they, they just emailed me and they said, oh, you know, Lynn Rose recommended you, blah, blah, blah. Would you be interested? Well, would I? <laughs> oh, let me see. <laughs> so um, I just jumped at it and I'm, I'm really enjoying doing that, actually, because it, it's something different. Yeah. There's a lot of um, knitted toys and accessories and all that kind of stuff, which I don't normally get a chance to do. So uh, that is actually really good fun. Um, and uh, they have a slot on the Create and Craft TV channel. So um, every now and then I have a look at that. I think it's on a Saturday or Sunday, I can never remember. Um, and some of the patterns that I've edited, recent, you know, recent edits are appearing, you know, the actual finished article on the TV, and that's really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that is cool. I didn't think yeah. about, um, it's obvious the bigger publications, bigger companies will need tech editors, but I didn't mm. really think of it. Um, so do you freelance for them or how does that work? Yeah, I freelance for them, yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's great. So you still get to do your own hours, you're your own boss, but then you've got this company that you can work alongside. Absolutely, yeah. And that is, that is a nice little buffer, you know, because I know I'm always going to get work from them. So that actually does help as a little buffer to if if if, if, if there's quiet times. Because I mean, for instance, when we first went into the, our first lockdown, yeah. um, my work did actually tear off a bit because so many of my designers have got young children, so they then had to be homeschooling and their whole routine just went up in the air. So the designing got shelved. Yeah. Once they got that all sussed out and they got their kids sorted out, they were designing like demons because they had so much time on their hands. <laughs> yes, I have found that, I don't want to say that I'm grateful for the virus because I'm not, but as a silver lining, because I no longer have to go into my workplace, it frees up a lot of my time in that I don't have two and a half hours travel anymore. Um, because although I only live 15 minutes away from my workplace, in rush hour on a bus, it was like an hour in the morning and an hour and a half on the way home. Um, so that's freed up no end of time which means mm. that I've got so much more time to be not only designing doing the admin of my of HGDC but making things as well yeah 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 I mean that that is a hell of a lot of time every day for a whole week yeah it makes such a difference it really does which means mm. that when I log off at five o'clock shut my laptop down I'm home as opposed to right I've got an hour and a half till I get home and then I need to feed myself. I could probably do with a walk to get away from the screen. Like I'm already home, so it's mm. made a big difference. And mm. um, I think without it, I would have still got a pattern out because I was working on it. But before COVID, I was getting up at like five in the morning to do one or two hours before I went to my day job. Oh, and that takes a toll after a while, mm. trying to get it all in. Whereas now i still get up early in the summer winter not so much so um 
but that's more time working mm. on what I want to work on. Yeah, absolutely. I'm guessing. So are you able to do your day job from home? Are you actually working from home? Yes, yeah, so I'm a trainee solicitor, um, oh, right. so I do that remotely. Um, I'm looking over at my desk set up now. Um, <laughs> I just I have to log in for five to nine, and then I'm done at five o'clock. Unless something major happens, I need to sort it out. But majority of the time, I'm logged off by five o'clock. Um, I think one thing I was going to ask you actually is about transferable skills because I have a lot of people say, "Well, I've not, I've not." got a qualification in crochet or knitting or and neither do I I'm pretty much self-taught um I've done a few courses on maybe photoshop and different things I want to do the sister mounting course and I think it's important like we've said to do courses as and when you can mm. but also you, I found that I've got a lot of transferable skills from what I've trained in in my day job and so I mm. wonder if you found that you had transferable skills from what you did previously Oh, absolutely, because I was a bookkeeper, so I was always crunching numbers and using spreadsheets, so that was perfect, yeah. perfect grounding for, for what I'm doing now, because all day long I sit and I crunch numbers on a spreadsheet, yeah. so it was home from home in a way. Um, you don't need any knitting or crocheting qualifications, all you need is to have enough personal experience yeah. um, to know your way around knitting, knitting or crochet, or know your way around the pattern. Um, understand the pattern, understand um, how it works. Um, that's all the qualifications you need. So it's just experience, really. Um, and also, you've got to have a certain eye for detail. Um, I mean, even even now, there are things that I do miss. I mean, it is only natural. Uh, but, um, you know, you've got to have a, a relatively good eye for detail and checking all the little things like, you know, do the hyperlinks work and all this kind of stuff, you know, um, things that people might not notice. What, what I always think of is um, people don't notice the things that are right, but they'll always notice something that's wrong. You know, that will always leap out at them more than the things that are right. So you've got to have a certain amount of eye, eye for detail. You've got to be able to, you've got to have a few years knitting or crochet experience behind you. And you've got to also, if you want, if you do want to be a tech officer, you can't be scared of numbers. Yeah. Be a number person because the whole thing is numbers. I mean, I've, I've got a friend who is a marvelous knitter, and she knits and crochets the most gorgeous things. But she doesn't. She's useless at maths, and she's always says to me, "I don't know how you can do that job." <laughs> she hates maths, but she can. She can, you know, sort of like stumble her way around the pattern. Yeah. And do any basic maths that you might need for a pattern, but to actually sit and number crunch to make sure that the pattern works she would not be able to do it well she wouldn't even want to do it um it, it does take a certain amount of um mathematical well i would say skill but you've got to you've got to be happy with numbers and you've got to know your way around the spreadsheet you've got to know your formulas yeah that is a big must you've got to know your yeah. formulas mm -hmm. i so fun fact about me Maths is not my thing. I do not like numbers and I'm not a fan of them. And it took me something like three, four attempts to pass my maths GCSE. Whereas you give me words, straight A student, very creative, love to write, love to craft a story. Mm. Um, you see, I'm the other way around. <laughs> yeah. And then I went to, when I did my um, postgraduate degree to train to be a solicitor, it's got an entire section on accounts. Oh, right. Nice. That could have been my undoing, and I sat the mark and I failed. And if I didn't pass that, I wouldn't pass my two year course that I'd paid thousands of pounds to do. And so I found that I really had to shift my mindset from I'm afraid of numbers, I don't get numbers, to um, numbers. I had to just basically say in my mind that numbers have a relationship just like words do. So even mm. if I had to write it out in words, so that I had a story for what the numbers were doing on the page. <laughs> this is how I had to get around it. I did that and it was one of my highest um, grades. And what I, what I did is I had to, didn't necessarily understand it, but I memorized the basic rules and just applied them. Doesn't mean I have a clue what's going on, but I know that it's going to be right because I memorized it. Yeah. Um, and so I've put that in my workbook because one of the biggest things for me was I felt really panicky about the numbers. I'm not, I'm not strong on numbers. I never have been. Um, 
but I don't want that to hold people back. So mm -hmm. I, you don't need to, um, I wouldn't, I'd say that I'm quite confident in what I do. I know that it's right, but that's only because I've, I know the basics and I apply it and then I'll send it to you mm -hmm. and you will check to make sure <laughs> I'm not massively off. Um, but I do find with Excel, it calculates it for you. So it's wonderful. Yes, yeah. exactly. So yeah. even if you think, I don't know, as long as you um, have the formulas there and you put them in, which yeah. is why in my workbook, I've got the list of formulas because Excellent. once I learned those, I was away and yeah. I refer back, I've got them written down. I kind of treated it like it was um, something I did for uni and I wrote down all the different formulas. Mm -hmm. So every time I needed to, I could go back and refer to them. I've pretty much got them memorized now, but I even still sometimes go back and check that I've mm. put everything, brackets, blah, 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 in the right place. Yeah. Um, Excel is a godsend. So if you don't like numbers, Excel does it for you. You just that is a very, very good point, actually. Yeah, yeah. As long as you can get around your head around those formulas, which, as you say, if you write them down, it's yes. easy peasy. Yeah. You know, you make sure that you've got your brackets in the right place and the commas in the right place and all yeah. the rest of it. Then you're away. Definitely, yeah. which is what yeah. I have to do because I numbers they're not my strong point. Sometimes even now I just think I'm like. <gasps> <laughs> what I'm doing. Uh, and then I have to walk away I, I find if I go on a walk and it's kind of in my mind I, my brain will figure out like it's a jigsaw piece right try this formula try this and it might work um, so I've put all of that in there and I've also put a section on um, if you're not comfortable in numbers because it took me like, I think it was four attempts to pass my GCSE maths like that's the level really? of, yeah that's the level of I do not understand and back then, um, my boyfriend at the time, his brother sat down with me and he said to me then, don't treat them as a different language, just treat it as a variation of English. And if you need to write it out, a story of what, what's happening. And so by applying that, you can engage that side of your brain. I think you might, are you a left-sided brain where you prefer numbers and I'm right where I prefer words? But you can, you can make them yeah. talk together. That is such a brilliant way of, of, of doing it. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. I've never heard of that before, but that is really clever. Really clever. Because yeah. it's the only, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have passed that exam because at that point I'd, I'd done it three times and I, it just did, they just don't make sense to me when you put Y equals X. Why? Why does it, why are you using numbers? What are you yeah. doing? Um, and also a lot of what they teach you at school, um, it just doesn't apply to anything I ever want to yeah. do in my life. Whereas if they'd have sat me down and said, right, we'll teach these formulas, you'll be able to make your own knitting patterns. Oh, I would have been all over it. <laughs> Boom, absolutely. Well, I mean, uh, when you calculate a sleeve, if it's a setting sleeve, um, you have to use Pythagoras theorem. Yeah. Now, when I was learning that at school, I was thinking, yawn, I'm never, ever going to use this. And here we are, 100 years later, and I'm having to use it. You know, my God. So, yeah, you just don't know. And that's why I want to do more grading courses because I need somebody to say, this is the exact formulas, this is how I use it, and then I can take that, write a story about it, so this means this, and you do this, and like write a description of what's going on, and then I can apply that in future designs, but I need to know that the first bit, the numbers, is correct, and I'm not just made that up. Um, and again, as you said, I'm sure there's, even in the designers you see, they will use slightly different ways to get what they want out of the Oh, they do. Yeah. 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 Everybody's got their own way of calculating things or getting from A to B. But as long as the end result's right, it doesn't really matter. Exactly. Yeah. And that's another thing that I learned that um, if anyone tells a story, they'll have their own way of doing it. And it's the same with numbers. You might have the basic principles, just like you do with the English language and grammar. And it's the same with numbers. The formulas have got basic rules, but you use them how you want to get mm. what you need out of them. So then once I started to realise it's not so much a this is right and this is wrong, um, it wasn't as intimidating. Obviously, you can still get it slightly wrong, but that's why you're here. So I don't have to worry oh, too much. <laughs> You'll pick it up if I've gone massively off piece somewhere. So, yeah. Um, 
maths are scary. I 100% get that. But as long as you apply the basics and then you've got a really strong tech editor behind you, I think you it just be feel fine with it. Yeah. yeah. Um, because you love numbers, I know that you will spot and be like, that's not quite right. Yeah. And that to me is where it's invaluable because I don't want to put a pattern out there that's wrong. No. I don't want to be worrying or fretting that I've not quite calculated something right and you'll be able to check it and be like maybe you should try it this way or this should come out as this number and that's perfect mm. Absolutely. perfect <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I think I had I don't know if I, oh the only other things I was going to talk about was um, every tech editor has a different way of doing things just like every designer has a different way of doing things so mm -hmm. um i've worked with a few different tech editors and i've had different experience with all of them and i think it's important for you to find a tech editor that really works with your style um that every tech editor has their own way of not only checking stuff but their own way of working as well um mm -hmm. and i'm sure you've had designers where you think not sure if we get on or you know and that's I'm that's normal and I just wanted to know if you'd got anything to add on that point as well well definitely because no two people are alike and you're going to get people that you gel with instantly and there's people that you're just not going to get on with you just don't you don't see things from the same angle um I think we we get on pretty well but I have had uh, clients where I've thought mm, this isn't working yeah. and um, you know they how can I put it um, they think they're right they know they're right and they won't take I mean when I when I when I correct um, a pattern I try not to be too rah 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 you've done this wrong I sort of <laughs> try and sort of, sort of say well actually this might not be right and so I try and sort of cushion the blow if you like yeah. Um, but you get some designers who are adamant that they're right and they won't they don't like to take uh, criticism because it is criticism. Yeah. Um that pattern's like their baby and they're giving you their baby and you're turning around and saying, Well actually there's stuff wrong with it. And some designers don't like that and I always try and be polite and sort of I don't go charging in like a bull in a china shop. But there are some designers who I've just not got on with who haven't liked my style, haven't liked my attitude, perhaps, I don't know. Um, but then on the same hand, on the other hand, I've had designers where I've thought, no, I don't like your approach yeah. to things either. So it is very much, it is a relationship because, okay, you're not friends, but you've got to have a good working relationship to, you've got to understand each other and understand where each other are coming from. And as a designer, you've got to be thick-skinned enough to actually be able to take the fact that maybe you have done something wrong, yeah. maybe something does need to be looked at and corrected, yeah. and that your pattern isn't 100% correct. You've got to be able to take that, because yeah. um, if you can't, then you shouldn't be doing it, quite honestly, because you're going to have to, at some point, somebody is going to actually turn around and say, well, actually, that's not right. If your tech editor doesn't do it, then your test, test knitters or crochets, your testers are going to throw their arms up in despair and say, look, this pattern isn't right. Yeah. So at some point, you've got to accept that. Um, and some designers just can't. <laughs> and it's, it's really weird, you know. They seem to think that they've created a perfect... Oh, God, I'm starting to bitch now. I'm saying, cut this bit out. <laughs> no, I fully understand because... Um, I so again taking from my experience in my day job I've drafted complex documents and then had my supervisor give it me back and be like wrong 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 don't like this wrong 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 and at that point you can either be like well I don't like you either or you need to step back which is what I try and do and be like mm -hmm. okay this is not a reflection of me personally this is not this pattern is not my baby it's a pattern and this tech editor is on the money and they're doing what I've asked them to do. Yeah. So even though it burns me sometimes to have to go back and make changes, you need to go back and make them changes and you need to smile while you do it. And if you throw Absolutely. a happy as a designer, you're going to struggle because the first time I did the testing process, I found that hard just because there was mistakes in there that shouldn't have been in there. It was my first time, so it was big. And I did start to take it as a personal attack and I had to really remind myself, 
they're not having a go at you they're actually trying to help you and get this yes. spot on um, that's the key and I'd rather it be wrong and you as my tech editor say this is wrong rather than it go out to the whole world and I have a hundred people buy it and a hundred people email me individually and say this is wrong because then I've been told a hundred times I'm wrong and at that point I am wrong because I bypass what the tech editor said the tester said and put it <laughs> out into the world yeah so, um, I see it as I'd rather have a friendly nudge from a tester and a tech editor explain exactly what needs changing mm. and have those hundred emails turn up and you have to then, you, you create more work for yourself. And I'm, Absolutely. I'm minimal effort. I'm, I don't even mm. like that. I'm not going to put something out that I'm then going to have to explain a hundred times. Mm. Um, it's like when I, I, I mean, I haven't designed many things, but I've designed a few things. And the first time I sent something to a tech editor, I was, Tech editor, I was mortified because <laughs> you found things that were wrong. No, you can't. I'm a tech editor, that should be perfect. <laughs> but you can't check your own work for a start, and there's always going to be things that you're going to miss. It's you're only human, you know. And so that was quite an interesting learning curve for me because I saw it from the other side, yeah. and that's when I realized actually, you know what, you've got to be bloody thick skinned to do <laughs> You've got to be very thick-skinned to do this. <laughs> you have to be. You really do. Mm. And it's, in a way, I have to dissociate and step back and realise it isn't directly on me. That pattern isn't me or my self-worth. And that's also useful then when it comes to sales because I find if you think, right, this is going to be my million-pound pattern in it and it sells pennies, you'll take that personally. So it's definitely yeah. something that you have to learn pretty quickly if you're going to carry on in this field um and yeah you the thick skin sometimes I do think did I really make that mistake did I really make that typo but because because you are invested in it and you wrote it you know how it should look so you can't see the mistakes anymore it's like you exactly. can't see the trees or whatever the saying is yeah that's can't right see it so no. Having and it doesn't matter how many times you look at it and how many times you check it and recheck it and recheck yeah. it. You know, in the end, it's just, you just, you literally don't see the wood for the tree. You don't. And you just have to stop looking at it and let someone else look at it. Like, I'm done with that. Whatever comes back, comes back. Mm. I hate making the edits. It's one of the bits that I just, I just can't be bothered to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so minimal effort and I... I and that's why I'm very systematic in my approach because if you've got a system, mm. you know it works and you're not missing anything. So in my workbook, I've got a list of like a tick list once you've done your pattern. So make sure you've got all of these elements on there. Have you checked all of these things? Have you checked your, you know, like a list. And once you've ticked all that off, that means you should have minimised the amount of edits that need to come back because yeah. it really bugs me when I've done something like spelt seam but incorrectly with the wrong spelling. And I know how I should spell it. So why have you done that? Yeah. <laughs> and I've done that numerous times. And then mm. rather than slip stitch ST, for some reason I always put S-L-S-P, like slip space. I don't know why. Oh. I so it's on my list now to check that I have put ST, not SP, because I mm. do it all the time. <laughs> but um, yeah, getting a thick skin. I feel like that needs to have its entire vlog all for itself of because if somebody retaliates to what you say with fire, it's not going to be a working relationship. You're going no. to like, well, I mean, you know, luckily I was, well, everybody that I've got that I work for now, yeah. I love and it's, we all have a really good relationship, but every now and then you get someone come along and think, actually, no. <laughs> And that's part and parcel of human nature because no matter where you go, there's always someone that isn't for you. But that's fine because there's other tech editors and there's other designers out there. And so Absolutely. There's plenty of both. So, yeah, you can always find somebody that you're going to get on with eventually. So, and yeah. that's a good point, actually, because I think some people say, a lot of people say to me, there's no point in me being a designer because there's so many out there. And people say, well, there's no point in me being a tech editor, tech editor because there's so many out there. But um, I try to have more of an abundance mindset where there's enough to go around. And as you said, um, you've got your client database and you can keep taking more on, but there would be a point where you'd be like, okay, I've got enough. And mm. so 
on that principle, you can never have enough tech editors and you can never have enough designers. Because um, there's always people out there that want different services. Mm. And there's always people, new people coming along all the time. So there's always going to be, the supply and demand will always be there. Um, so, yeah. I mean, I hear people say that a lot as well, but I, I just say go for it. Whether you're a designer or a tech editor, just go for it. Because, And also, with, with with both things, you get people that just design one particular thing, might just be knitters or crocheters, or they might just do socks, and they might just do jumpers or whatever. And the same with tech editors. You'll get some tech editors that don't grade, some that do, some that don't do charts, some that do, some that only like to do garments, or some that only, that only like to do accessories. I mean, I don't do baby clothes. Yeah. I don't do children's clothes, I only do adults. So that's a whole section that I don't do, but the next person might. So there's always plenty of people to, you know, the, the whole pot is so big and so varied that there's plenty of people to match with each each skill set. Definitely. I think when I last checked, the, there was a website that said Ravelry has 4.5 million active users. I mean, even if only 10% of them are designers and 5% mm. of them are tech editors, that's still a lot of work. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And then we haven't actually covered, we should quickly say what the tech editing process is. So um, I would email you and I would say, hi, I've got this design. It's a new jumper that's coming. Whoa, I like that, actually. I've been looking at that. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. I finished it last night, so I thought I'd wear it. Um, and then I would email you. And then the process from there, we should definitely explain what that is. So you would get an email from me. Um, and what would we do from there? Right, okay. I'd get an email from you. And um, depending, normally, the first email I get is just, hello, I've got a design... I've got a pattern that's ready for editing. Are you taking on new clients? Yeah. Um, at that point, um, I would write back and say, yes, I am taking on new clients. Um, but I always need to see a copy of the pattern, even if it's just a rough draft, just and, and a couple of photos, just so that I can see what I'm, what you know, what's being expected of me. I would then, if they if they haven't said in their email what they want, I would then ask them to clarify, do they just want a tech edit, do they want it graded, do they want a chart, do they want a schematic, what do they want? Yeah. So once once I've established all of that and I've seen a copy of the pattern, I can then give a rough estimate on what I've seen at that stage. Uh, nine times out of ten, my estimate is normally pretty accurate and I don't have to sort of write back and say, actually it's taking me a bit longer because yeah. X, Y, and Z, you know, normally that, that does normally work out quite well. So once I've sent my quote and I've said my availability, um, you know, I can do it this week or such and such a week or whenever, um, I always ask the designers to confirm whether they want me to go ahead or not so that I can mark out some time for them. Um, and then once that's done and we're both happy and we're both happy with the arrangement, um, I will then either work from the pattern that they've already given me or they'll say, well, look, that is just a rough draft. I've got a couple of weeks, you know, I might not be doing the editing other couple of weeks, so I'll say, you know, during that time, I'll, I'll tidy up the pattern, send you some help of photographs. So um, that, that all goes on while they're waiting for me to do the edit. When I finally get the um, pattern that, that I'm going to edit, um, I then go through it and I check for, well, just about everything really, like you have a checklist, um, I check for uh, spelling, grammar, um, make sure that what is in the photo is actually, is that the pattern actually tallies with the photo. Um, I make sure that the yarn that they've, they've used is, is still out there um, and that the yardage that they've given is correct. You know, all, all that sort of nitty gritty stuff, the, the needle sizes and all that kind of stuff. I then go onto the pattern and I check it. Um, I check it for grammar. I check it for just a, um, layout and um, make sure if something's supposed to be involved that it's involved all the way through and all this kind of stuff. Um, and I also check the numbers. The most important thing is the numbers to make sure that, you know, cast on X number of stitches or make a chain this long and then you do so many stitches. Uh, make sure all the repeats work, um, that kind of stuff, across all the sizes of bits of garment. Um, and then if the chart is needed, I'll then do the chart and the schematic and you know all the all the extra add-on bits that might be needed. Um, 
one of the things, there, there are some things that, that come up, that come up a lot, and I just sort of think, everybody does it, and it's just, it's just something that, 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 that comes through. And one of, the, one of the worst things is the copy and paste function. Now, everybody uses copy and paste, everybody loves copy and paste, but quite often, well, I won't say quite often, but sometimes a, um, a line of, um, of, of the pattern that's going to be repeated throughout the pattern is copied and then pasted throughout the pattern. But sometimes that piece that's been copied has got an error in it and the designer hasn't spotted it. Yeah. So that error ends up polluting the whole pattern because it goes all the way through. Yeah. And I had one recently where it was um, very repetitive and they had copied a chunk and they kept repeating it throughout the pattern. And there was a mistake in it. So I had to highlight it every single time. And it, it, I'll be honest, it drove me up the wall. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know, you know, like we just said, you can only look at, you, you keep looking at something and in the end you can't see it. And so that's how mistakes get through. But I just always sort of think to myself, I mean, I've probably done it myself. I mean, we all do it. But I just sort of think, if you want to copy and paste that thing, double check it. Right, yeah. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh dear, yeah, I'm sure you could do um, a whole list of things that designers do that you're like, why? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So anyway, um, once, I've, once I've got that first edit done and I'm happy with what I've done because I do it and then I, I sort of recheck, make sure that I've, because I've, 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 I um, print out, um, I print out a copy of the pattern and I scribble all over it and then I transfer it onto, um, the copy that I'm going to send to the client, oh, uh, back to the designer. Um, so once I've done all that, I then check it to make sure I've picked everything up and have a quick read through to make sure there's something else that I've missed. I then send it back to the designer and say, here's my third round of edit, edits. Um, can you look through it? And yep. then send it back to me to... It comes to me at that point and then I'm like, did I make those mistakes? <laughs> <laughs> and then I get back onto, I use Canva to write mine up. So I get on there. I put them on. I'm going to be honest and say I moan about it in my head thinking it will take longer than it does. And if I just got yeah. on with it, it would be done because you very easily highlight, you put in exactly what I need to put where. I just need to sit and do it and stop moaning. It probably takes me not even an hour usually to sort mm. of that out. Um, and then I print it again, check it's everything's okay. And then um, I either send it back to you if I feel like something needs to check in or I just go straight to the testers um, and then I say thank you so much and I pay your invoice. Mm. It's always best really to send it back just for a final read through just to make sure that you have picked everything up because sometimes there are patterns, I mean it wasn't the case with yours but I have had patterns where there's been a lot of things that need to be corrected so um, I do like to see it, like to get it back just to make sure that everything has been picked up. And then I give it another read through, just to make sure that what is corrected is correct, and yeah. make sure I, I didn't miss anything the first time yeah. around. Um, and then that's normally, I normally only have to see a pattern twice, unless there's yeah. something really, really wrong with it. Um, and then that's it, and then as you say, the designer can go off and get it tested, and then I'll raise an invoice, and that is that one complete. Yeah, definitely. Because yeah. when you send through whatever needs amending I'll print it off and as I go through I tick each one so that hopefully I don't miss anything um, mm. so I'm very paper based I like to have if I've got to proofread or do something I like to have it in front of me mm. even though I work on a screen a lot um, but yeah that's the bit that's the bit out of every, and I don't even hate it because there's nothing I hate within HGDC but the bit I loathe the most is making the amends and that's purely because on an insecurity level, you're like having to face the mistakes you've made. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely. It's human nature. <laughs> it is human nature. We don't like to be told we've done something wrong. Um, and, it's, and, and my job is a bit like being an auditor. Yeah. You know, you get the auditors in at work. They are finding, they are there to find mistakes. And unfortunately, that's what I'm doing. I'm there to, to, to find mistakes. But, you know, to make sure that ultimately that that pattern is, is, is usable. You know, so that the, the knitter or the crocheter, you know, the person at the end, um, enjoys making it and doesn't have to keep stopping and thinking, oh, God, this stitch count doesn't work or, you know, yeah. whatever. <laughs> and that's, that for me is one of the biggest bits. I don't want numbers to be wrong. Um, 
I think I should have been tested for dyscalculia as a child because the figures, they move when I look at them. So when I type some, a figure out, it's a different figure to what's in front of me, which is why I then have to print it and like put something under it, you know, to block the rest of it and check. So I, I'm sure I should have been tested for that, but anyway. Um, so yeah, having you there, knowing that you're a number crunching whiz is perfect <laughs> for me. Um, and yeah, I would, I would, without a doubt, I would say to anybody that's a new designer, don't skip the tech editing because people might think, well, it's an, it's a layout that I don't want, that I don't have the money for or something like that, but you will more than make that back from your pattern. As long as your mm. pattern, if your pattern's got flaws in it, people won't leave you good reviews. People won't make the pattern and you won't have the social proof to post. And so then you won't get more sales and then you won't make that money back. So that's right. This is it. I mean, that pattern is a reflection on you. Yeah. And it's got to be a good reflection. Otherwise, you aren't. You're not going to survive because there are a lot of designers out there. Yeah. Um, so you've got to make sure that your pattern is pretty much perfect. Yeah. As close to perfect, practically perfect in every way, Mary Poppins would say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you also pointed out that I didn't put hyperlinks into my own YouTube tutorials and it had never even occurred to me and it's not in my previous pattern so I'm actually going to go back and put them in but I'm going to try and rejig it in some way so there's a list of tutorials people might find yeah helpful. I don't know it's interesting because you had that little circle yeah. with whatever I can't remember what was written in it now and it just screamed at me hyperlink and I didn't do so, it yeah so yeah. great tip so I'm going to go I've only got three patterns, so it's not going to take me a lot to go back um, and then mm -hmm. going forward. But yeah, you'll see it in this one. I'm going to have like a list of um, tutorials because I've done quite a few tutorials now for people. Mm -hmm. I'll just be able to click and go through to it. So thank you so much for that. That was really yeah. useful. And like you said, it's not so much looking for what you've done wrong. It's um, as well as what you've done right, but how to enhance it, how you can mm -hmm. make it better. Definitely. The yeah. I mean, I always say to designers, whether it's crochet or knitting, always think, doesn't matter how technical or how complicated your pattern is, um, you might say it's an you know, pattern from experience to crochet or whatever, you're always going to have a newbie that's going to want to try that pattern. It's human nature. So I always say to designers, try and think of the newbies and put in as much information as you need, to, as you think is needed. The experience um this is all crochets we'll ignore that yeah but the newbies will thank you so much for putting that in they will be so grateful for it so yeah put in as many youtube things yeah. as you want and you know hyperlinks to this that and the other you, you can't put you can't put in uh, too many in i don't think no because you've got to be able to um cover a wide spectrum yeah. of um levels of expertise and as I said, I'm minimal effort and I don't want people messaging me saying, how do I do this when I can just put it all in the pattern, which is why my patterns are so in-depth. Um, and I think that's, again, the system coming out in me that but if I put it all there, then I don't need to have lots of, I don't know if I'm lazy or if I'm just super efficient. One or You're the super other. efficient. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think... You've been wonderful. I've just got a couple more questions and I'll let you get on with your day. I'm taking up your time. Um, I'm, I'm having a word of a time. I'm enjoying <laughs> it. <laughs> I'm loving this because before I came into designing my own patterns, I didn't really know much about tech editing. I didn't know why it was important. And I've been mainly self-taught. So it's been able to speak to you about so many different things. It's really, really insightful. Um, if you were a brand new tech editor, how would you get yourself out there? So you could get clients. That is a that is a good question because it's changed a lot in the in the sort of four or five years that I've been doing it. It's changed enormously. Um, just uh, the things that I've done is um, I've got an add on Ravelry um, underneath. You know the little banners that come up at the bottom of certain um, groups. Um, I went through various different groups and I've got a little banner at the bottom um, on Ravelry. Um, put yourself out there on Instagram, put yourself out there on Facebook, join lots of Facebook. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of Facebook. If you looked at my profile, I don't do anything on Facebook, but 
but I do belong to quite a few different groups and just make yourself known on there. Um, be chatty. Um, if, if someone's put a query on there about something, answer it. If you can, answer it. Or, you know, to just, just make your presence known. Or if you don't know the answer, especially on, face, on Facebook, you can put following as a little comment and you keep seeing all the other comments coming through. Um, it's just make yourself as visible as possible, I think. If you, if you can, get yourself together um, some sort of um, website. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Um, get yourself a website and put, put as much information on there as you can about being a tech editor, what you do and bits about you and whatnot. Yeah. Um, another really good way to get started is when you do get your first few clients, offer um, your, your edits for free or at a reduced rate for a review because reviews, yeah. um, they're just priceless. They yeah. really are. So you get a few reviews, put them on Instagram, put them on Facebook, put them on your website. They speak volumes for you. Yeah. Um, and really, that is all you can do. Just make yourself as, as visible as you possibly can. Um, some people have done uh, set up newsletters. I'm not a newsletter person. I'm not a, I mean, I can chat with you like this, but to sit in front of a blank screen and think, oh my God, what, what am I going to write about? I find it really difficult. So I don't do newsletters, but some people do. Yeah. Uh, if you do do a newsletter, um, this is something that Joe Lee always says, you, you, you give, 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 and at the bottom, you give them like a call to action. You know, yeah. do you need a, a pattern editing? I've got so many slots this month, blah, blah, blah. Um, so yeah, just keep yourself as visible as you possibly can. That is the answer. I think follow the right sort of designers on Instagram. Follow your favorite designers. I mean, they, they are going to have, or you have their tech editors, but they'll have, but their following, in their following, there might be designers and there might be aspiring designers and there might be somebody there who might want your services. So just keep following people, answering, you know, putting answering posts and make yourself as visible as you possibly can. Perfect. I think you were recommended to me by Lynn, I believe. Um, oh, well, that's right. Yes. Yeah. Um, which is really good. And I think Lynn had been recommended to me by Rosina of Scenes and Rogers. Um, but another place that I found tech editors, again, not really being part of the community not really knowing where to look. I looked at um, the credit on patterns to find who people would use. So I would definitely say to a designer, make sure you credit your tech editor because without them, the pattern wouldn't be what it is, which is yeah. why I always make sure I put with special thanks to whoever tech edited it because you need business coming your way. And it's, I don't understand, but sometimes I feel like designers are like, that's my tech editor, I'm not sharing. No, you need to share so your tech editor's still there. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not many people do that. I only know, I've only, only got two other designers that do that. I think you should ask them to do it because you have to credit your photographers and things like that. I really think you should credit mm. your tech editor because you've put a service into that. Um, and it, I just think it's very... Um, just why wouldn't you? I think you should ask people. Ask them to I do think it. I will actually, yeah, because I mean, you know, you can have the most fantastic photos and all the rest of it, but if that pattern's wrong, then yeah. it's wrong. And people are not going to want it. People are not going to come back to you. So your pattern's got to be right. So your your tech editor is actually quite an important part very, of the process. Very important because even if you've got so so pictures that's okay as long as your tech editor is ironed everything out and you also you you do charts and things like that as well don't you yeah yeah um, and if somebody came to you and said look I'm a new designer um I don't know how to grade would you be able to grade for them yes yeah um yeah. so and I think that's really useful for people to bear in mind um if you find grading intimidating mm. then you can always get somebody to grade them for you um mm. I would always say have a go because it's best that you do learn um, mm. because sometimes if I was to give you a random pattern say okay can you grade this that's a lot more work than if I graded it myself and knew that it worked so that's got the bigger price tag but it's definitely a way to get started. Absolutely I mean, look, if, I, if I was to grade something it is very long and involved and yeah. it'll take about two weeks because once I've graded it I've got to send it to a tech editor for them to check my grading. Yeah. So if I, if I get a pattern that wants grading, the first thing that I do is I tech edit 
the size that yeah. it's been done in. So I know that that worked. Yeah. Um, I then had to, well, before I even start doing it, I had to find out what um, sizing chart yeah. they have worked from. And I have to use the same one, whether it's the mountain or your soldiers or whoever. Um, so then once I've got all that information, then I can grade the, the, the whole, once, once I've taken it and I know that what is in front of me is correct, I can then grade it across all the sizes. But that grading has then got to be checked. Yeah. So I've got to send it to a tech editor to get that work checked. So the whole thing is not just a case of emailing me a pattern saying, oh, what was graded? You know, I've got to say, well, okay, well, I've now got to make sure that my, my tech editor has got time yeah. to grade, check my work. So it is it, actually quite a long and drawn out process, which a lot of people don't realise. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm happy to do it and I love doing it, but a lot of people don't actually they think it would take the same amount of time as just doing an ordinary edit. No, and it doesn't. It's a grading, lot more involved. Yeah, grading takes, I wouldn't say a huge amount of time. It does. It takes a huge amount of time. I'm just gonna it does take a huge amount of time. There's two ways about it. It's okay, but no, it takes a huge amount of time. Um, mm. From the first pattern I ever did to now, I'm quicker because I've got my processes, my systems, my formulas. Yeah. I understand it better. But it still takes a, quite a chunk of time. It really mm. does. Um, so yeah. And you're you're working on your pattern, so you've got that vision in your head. Uh, but when you're when you're grading someone else's pattern, you haven't got that vision. So you're literally going by the numbers. So it does it makes it even more difficult then because you're you you you're well. I mean, you've got to create the sizes the same as the sample size, but there are still going to be quite yeah. a few things, especially when you're going to from a very small size to a very large size. Yeah. You know, it's not a case of, well, just adding X number of stitches on for, you know, each yeah. side. It doesn't work that way, you know, because your shoulders don't get bigger and things like that. So, you know, the boots might get bigger, but the shoulders don't. So you've got yeah. to do all the proportional stuff. So it, it is very involved. And if it isn't your pattern and you haven't got that vision, then it does make it the a bit more difficult because you are slightly working in the dark. Yeah. I would definitely recommend... If you're a new designer, um, start with, most people start with accessories. I went straight in with a jumper. I don't know if I was being overly ambitious or what, but I did that. I don't really do accessories, so I just jumped in, but do it quite simple. Like, mm -hmm. this is a very simple stitch. Granny squares, it's very modular, so it builds very easily. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you might not want to go in with a very complex cable that then needs adjusting for the different sizes different yeah. placement loads of different charts on your first one like be kind to yourself and just make mm -hmm. it a bit simpler I mean, um, what you've done there a uh, really nice basic drop shoulder that's yeah. perfect for beginners yeah you, know, you don't want to you don't want to go wading in doing a a raglan with all sorts of complicated um stitch patterns and god knows what because you are going to come on stuff very yeah, quickly is the exam it's called example because it's the example from the workbook and i purposely went with drop shoulder because as you said it's so simple and yeah. they're just big body panels with sleeves mm. put on um you can learn the basics mm. from there then you can go on and learn even more information Absolutely. rather yeah. rather than covering ways to size grade i think there's courses out there that they will cover size grading different types of um like the set and sleeve and things like that. I just do mm. one jumper from start to finish, mm -hmm. um, which gives you a really good overview. And from there you can go on and learn. Um, maybe in the future, I'll do more of like a, like the next level with mm. different things, but I just wanted it so that beginners have got a starting point. I wish yeah. this course was there when I started. <laughs> yeah, because Sister Mountain, she does. Um, in, in, in her sweater design course, the one that I did, you had the choice of a raglan, um, a drop shoulder, or a set in sleeve, um, and then different necklines, a scoop, a boat, V. Um, so, but that did actually get quite complicated at times because it, it was a huge um, thing for her to take on because what you did there is perfect because you just got that one shape, um, makes it easier, but she was trying to do three or four different, or well, three different shapes, three different necklines, but all the permutations of those, it just goes on and on and on. Yeah. So it was, it would have been quite a headache to write that, that course. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really do want to do that course. I would tell her beforehand that I have my own course and make it available for her to see. Like, I don't want to be copying or... Mm. Um, and I always put resources at the end that I've consumed myself, but I want to learn, I want to improve my own skills because I've mainly done drop shoulder because um, it's simple. And mm. so, yeah, I've... I've definitely taught the basics and then there's a whole world out there and so many possibilities to learn yeah. um, and then you go into knitting and then it quadruples <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> all the stitches wow yeah. yeah so there's a lot coming a lot of patterns coming from me um excited for and Excellent. also it was good to find somebody that um also does crochet because Knitting is a bigger beast. It is a bigger world. Um, mm-hmm. So I found that some tech editors that I approached, they didn't crochet. So although they understood, they're not a crocheter. So I felt that they that, that might be a limit. Um, I wanted somebody who could crochet because then I imagine in your mind, you could see it panning out. Yes. You can crochet. Whereas if you don't crochet, you're applying knitting and that's it is different, so you can't crochet. I don't personally. I don't see how you could you could edit a crochet pattern because you've got to understand the stitches. I mean, for a start, when you knit, the work grows down the way. But when yeah. you crochet, the work grows up the yeah. way. So straight away, you've got a fundamental difference there. That if you don't, if you can't crochet, you're going to get really confused because you're not going to understand the construction. Yeah. So, to my mind, um, I think if you're gonna if you're gonna edit a crochet pattern, you've got to be able to crochet. No two ways about it, because the construction, but everything about it is so so different. It is, it is, which is why I've aimed mine at crochet because, like you said, I've learned a lot from knitting mm. and can knit, and a lot of the textbook not textbooks but books that I've got that help me are for knitting. And then I've had to cross apply it. And like you said, okay, so they've gone from here down, but I'm going from here up. Mm, yeah. <laughs> you have to figure that all out in your head. Yeah. Um, and then samples are very different. Crochet builds up a lot quicker in my mind. Mm. Um, yeah. And it uses more yarn, but it, it does work up quicker. Yeah. Um, and even I also find that with knitting, you might have a different purpose because you could make something really intricate and lazy, lazy, lacy, not lazy, lacy. <laughs> um, you might not want to do that with crochet. I, I don't like the small crochet hooks personally. Yeah. So, um, and knitting, knitting has a different look as well and a different fabric. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah. Crochet, def- definitely with the granny square, it's see through. So, if you're making clothing with that, you need to be aware of the fact that. If that's going to be trousers or something, you <laughs> need some modesty. Whereas knitting gives you a very dense fabric, unless you like this. Yeah, so, yeah, um, yeah. Because with when I just going back to the the tech editing course, when I did my initial tech editing course, it was finishers only, but I was able to apply the rules to crocheting because I had enough crocheting experience to do that. But so many people came along who just who just did crocheting, not knitting, and they couldn't get their head around the course. Yeah. So uh, Lynn Rowe now does Jolie's crochet course, um, and it's purely for crocheters who want to tech edit. That's uh, because although it's the same, it is different, as I said, as I just said. So you do need to have that understanding. That and although you know, like I was able to apply that that knitting um, course to crochet, a lot of people wouldn't wouldn't even know where to begin if yeah. they haven't if they haven't got enough experience yeah. to be able to. Um, cross-reference it. That's a very good point. Would you be able to share where we can find you online and then maybe after send links to the course you did and the course you just mentioned because I know I've got a lot of crocheters that want to look into tech editing so they would find mm-hmm. those very useful. So if you can tell us where we can find you online if we want your services, that would be great. Okay, um, well I can give you the link yeah. uh, but my um, website is Tampa for Thomas Studio yeah. In fact, everything is Tabitha Thomas Studio. <laughs> I'm Tabitha Thomas Studio on Instagram as well. Um, on Ravelry, if you want to see what I've been up to on, on Ravelry, I'm B Lindy, which is B W E L I N D I. But I'll send you a link to that as yeah. well. 
because uh, on there I've created a um, a project folder of all the tech edits, or most of the tech edits, I've, tech edits I've done, uh, which gives you a really good overview of what I can do. Yeah. Uh, but I'll give you the links to all of those. I'll email them to you. Perfect. And I'll put them on the screen for everyone that's watching so they can, because that is something that I've had quite a few questions on and I'll talk to you about some of this off recording so I don't tell everyone all the good stuff right now. But um, people want to know where can I find tech editors, where can I find testers. Um, so definitely I've told them they can find who I've used in my patterns um, to look for hashtags. And like you said, tech editors will try and make themselves as visible as possible. Mm -hmm. um, I really, really, really hope that you ask people to put you in your in the patterns. I will do. I will, definitely, yeah, I will do. Good. Um, and then you've got your portfolio on Ravelry, so that's really good. Because I do think, um, I certainly do, when I get recommendations, I go look at and try and find work that they've done to see if, um, whether I, the work I do will mesh with their style or not. Mm. If somebody only does Baroque knitting and then I rock up with a granny square, it's not going to work. <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> So, um, yeah that's really useful but thank you so much for everything you shared today I've really enjoyed it and I know there's so much information in here the tribe are going to be really grateful so thank you so much for all your time well thanks for inviting me I've really enjoyed it I've had a great time I can carry on <laughs> <laughs> we are going to carry on but I'm not going to record it because I don't want them to hear all of the stuff that way <laughs> so I'm going to press um stop right now Welcome back Tribe, how did you find that? I oh, loved it, so much information, really, really, really enjoying this series. Thank you so, so much Linda for coming on and talking all things tech editing, for helping everyone understand why it's so important. Um, I actually spoke to her after we had stopped recording about other things I've got coming to you, which I'm just buzzing about. Um, I can't share right now so tribe if you got this far which I know you all have please 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 drop a comment below um, because it makes all of the difference give this video a thumbs up drop a comment below of the project that you are currently working on whilst you were watching this vlog so that um, everybody can have a good chat and also drop comments below to thank Linda or if you've got any further questions or anything you took from this video that would be great to see. I have been working on this blanket and it's coming in a vlog soon so I'll be sure to drop a comment below to say I'm working on this blanket and you lot drop your comments below as well, okay? So thank you so, so much, Linda. Thank you so much, Tribe, for watching. I've got more lined up for you. So make sure you are subscribed and that you come back. Um, and I will see you again in the next video. Tribe Stars, I will see you in your Inside HDDC video. If you want to go and check them out, the link is below. Oh, and I've put all the links below for um, Linda, for Tabitha Thomas Studios and for the courses that she mentioned. So go and check all that out too. AK Drive, thank you so much. See you soon.